So it's amazing to be here with Ohana, students, faculty, friends, aloha. aloha. I, so some of you have seen, in fact, probably all of you have seen the mural that is at the entrance to BYU Hawaii, formerly Church College of Hawaii. With David O. McKay standing around, standing there at a flagpole with all the children gathered around. Well, I remember standing outside of Laie Elementary 54 years ago for the flag ceremony. Now, Clinton Kanahele was our uh, principal, and uh, some of us had shoes and others chose not to wear them. In the few minutes we have today, I'd like to share with you my leadership story and a few lessons I have learned along the way that may be of value to you. So here's a picture of us then and now. She had turned 16 when we began dating. As we began our career together, there were several early lessons which affected the direction in our life. My first job related to what I was studying in school. I was working for the Idaho National Engineering Laboratory in Southeast Idaho. I was a computer programmer who analyzed the data from nuclear reactor experiments. This was back in the days before personal computers, back when we still worked with punch cards, mainframes, and Fortran. The lessons I learned while working for the government was I do not like working for large companies. As I calculated and looked at people around me, I thought that only about 20% of the people were actually working. The other lesson I learned is that I did not want to write computer code forever. So that last lesson, not wanting to write computer code, led me back to school to pursue a higher degree. I began working with Pete Clark, a professor at BYU, studying the effects of couponing on the sales of dog food. So they were used to be a lot more popular, these coupons, you take them to the store and get a discount. We tried to, we tried to estimate what the effect was, whether use of coupons increased sales or whether we just lost money. As a part of the MBA program, I took a course in business ethics. I received a good grade in the class, but the lessons truly did not affect me. I believed that I was a good person than that, and that that was all I really needed to know about business ethics. It wasn't until later on in my career that I understood truly what it meant to be honest in your dealings with your fellow men. After graduation, Debbie and I moved to Boston to work for a business startup. We grew from a company with only 20 employees to 450 employees in the first year. Part of this growth was the acquisition of Wharton's Economic Forecasting Associates model, which was founded by Nobel Prize winner Lawrence Klein. We, later, we used their models to forecast quarterly world economic growth. Again, we were still using mainframes at the time. At the end of the year, there was widespread disagreement as to the future direction of our company. Imagine growing from 20 to 450 all in one year. There was a banking group, there was a marketing group, there was a forecasting group. All had conflicting ideas. Unbridled growth can cause a company to lose direction. I joined another startup in the Boston area that began using microcomputers and write a software package to produce charts for business. I was hired as a product manager, but because of my background, I spent an awful lot of my time writing code so that we had a product to sell. I was promised ownership in the company. The president was a member of the church who lived in my stake. A venture capital firm 
gave him some money to begin the business. So I wrote software, but at the end of the year, I was fired to prepare the company for acquisition to make the financials look better. Verbal promises of ownership are not binding, not even from church members, and especially not from family members. In writing preserves relationships. This was a hard lesson in business ethics. Now, shortly after they fired me, the venture capital firm sold the company to Lotus Software. Now, Lotus had a product called 123. This was the predecessor to Excel. They sold it for over a million dollars. It became a product called GraphWriter, and the company made millions on that product. Venture capital companies can be dangerous to your career, as you may no longer be in control. Now, when I was at kind of my lowest point, here I was. I was, you know, had an MBA out of school, living in the Boston area, just got fired just before Christmas. Pretty depressed. Spent a lot of time on my knees saying, Lord, what do I do next? And you know, I thought it was interesting. The Lord answered my question with something I wasn't expecting. He didn't tell me about what to do next on, in terms of my career. He told me, you will have many jobs in your life, and they will change. But what won't change, and will also bring you lasting joy, is your wife and children and family relationships. That lesson became an important part to my future and to how I made decisions. Okay, there we go, okay. Now I gotta go, there we go. <laughs> After a six month job search, we moved to Chicago. So Boston to Chicago and joined a marketing consulting firm, John Morton Company. It was founded by Richard Morton Johnson and John Curtis Jones. They took their names, created John Morton Company. They developed marketing models to aid companies in developing and selling their products. They pioneered a method called conjoint analysis to collect information from consumers. Ah, sorry. A couple of lessons I learned there. One, consulting requires you to work under your clients' deadlines. That meant for me, I frequently was in the office on Saturdays. They encouraged me to come in on Sundays. I said, no, I'm not coming in on Sundays. Clients impose deadlines on us. Before I left John Morton Company, the year before I left, I think I had 100,000 air miles in that one year. Sometimes I would leave home in the morning before the children were out of bed, and I would get home after they were asleep. Okay. So Rich Johnson began a software company. He was one of the founding partners of John Morton Company. And <clears throat> He started a software company called Sawtooth Software. In Sun Valley, he used tools developed for, the, for uh, a variety of clients. He approached the partner, Curtis Jones, about inviting me to come join him in Sun Valley. And this was another important lesson in ethics. So the partner wanted to take me away from John Morton Company. I was manager of technical services at John Morton Company he approached the remaining partner and said, can I invite Chris? Even before talking it over with me. Now for me, because of the um, track I was on as a consultant, I was eager to get away and come back to that original lesson that family, wife, family relationships are so important. So my move to 
Sawtooth software, I was given a guarantee of 10% ownership in writing. My salary went down because, again, this was kind of a business startup. We moved from Chicago to Sun Valley, Idaho. In the first two months, our sales did not cover our payroll. My wife stayed in Chicago for a little while to try to sell our house. And this might have been a very short-term job. But one of the big differences in the software industry, we were under our own deadlines and not those imposed by others. There were no venture capitalists or involved or any consulting clients that we needed to satisfy. Okay, let's see if I can. So this is where Sawtooth gets its name. The Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho, located near Sun Valley. We were founded in 1983. Rich Johnson and his wife are over here on the right. Debbie and I are here on the left. Next, I will explain some of the principles we use to create Sawtooth software. First of all, let's start with the mission statement. The company exists to meet individual and family goals. Now think about that. How, what is the vision statement of most companies? Okay? It was not created to benefit customers. It was not created to benefit venture capitalists or any outside interests. The company was founded to benefit us as people. Amazon, Amazon advertises itself as the most customer-centric company in the world. Sawtooth Software has taken a much different approach. So, but in order, hold on, now I'm getting my slides mixed up, there we go. But in order for all of this to be realized, we understand that in order for us to meet our goals, we have to um, meet the needs of customers, okay? We also were based on the premise that as the company succeeds, we desire that employees and their families also enjoy in that success. Hence, that's why Rich gave me 10% ownership in the company as soon as the company was created and I joined them. Okay. So what are some of the keys to starting a successful company? First of all, <clears throat> The company is 100% employee owned. There's no outside debt. We have generous employee benefits, such as a SEP, that's a Simplified Employee Pension Plan, HSA, Health Savings Accounts, unlimited snacks. Now the programmers really like that one. We like it too because uh, they tend to stick around. <clears throat> now, if an employee stays with the company, we make them an offer to become a shareholder in the company. We meet together weekly as a staff meet, in a staff meeting. Most decisions are made by consensus. If an employee is to leave the company, they are required to sell their shares back to the company, part of the agreement for receiving shares. Now in an S Corp, profits flow through to the shareholders. You don't need to be a large company to be profitable. So we've had various companies over time uh, try to acquire us and we always come back to the question why would we sell our company to you? What benefit is there for us? We manage the company, we manage uh, the profits, enjoy in the profits and there's no real reason. Many of the offers that we've actually received over the time, we said, well, if we just look at our profits over the next three or four years, that's how much you're offering uh, us for the company, and we would be giving up our own destiny or our own ability to control our future. We emphasize profit over growth. 
We believe that physically responsible employees who remain with Sawtooth for their entire career will have over a million dollars in their retirement and savings accounts when they retire. Pretty cool, huh? So <clears throat> we also had a rainy day fund. We, we didn't have any outside shareholders, so we were only worried about ourselves. We'd established a rainy day fund. We had money put away in case economic times turned bad. We've only had a couple of those in our history. We've never had to lay anyone off. We maintain normal hours and internal deadlines. We understand that in order for an employee to be successful and not burn out, at about 5 o'clock, they need to go home. And I would actually go around the office kicking people out of the office saying, it's time to go home. You need to go do something else. Because that really led to long-term uh, tenure for these employees. In fact, in the first 15 years of the company, after, um, I'll tell you about it in a bit, but we moved, it, moved the company from uh, Sun Valley, Idaho to uh, Squim, Washington on the Olympic Peninsula. And once we were in the, on the Olympic Peninsula, I think we only lost maybe two or three employees in the next 15 years. Empl one of them to retirement and two of them decided to go somewhere else, okay? Pretty good retention. And if you retain employees, if they feel a part of it, if they feel that they are benefiting by being a part of the company because they have ownership in that company, then there's a really good reason to stay around and other offers are not that attractive, okay? So, <clears throat> Our belief was that we invest in people and not in real estate or fixtures. When I first joined the company, my desk was a door that was stretched across two filing cabinets. So <clears throat> the interesting thing about software is the second unit you sell costs you almost nothing except in support. So it's very scalable. If employees own the company, they are less likely to leave. There's a family feel. Team building. We used to bring the entire company to Hawaii every other year. Kids, wives, everyone included. We did that for many, many years. Now we're getting a little large, and that's a little more difficult to do. But we, in the early years, we had some wonderful trips back to Hawaii. We... <coughs> also understood that if we outsource development and if there is a problem, you can't fix it. So we did not outsource anything. Everything is internally developed. And finally, the point I want to make is that, um, here, hold on. Hold on. I always had the philosophy that when I was hiring people to join the company, and it was never just me, it was always a group effort because we were all in it together. If I always hired people smarter than me, then eventually I would become the least smart person in the company. And so in 2013, I stepped down as a full-time employee, sold my shares back to the corporation, and went on a mission. We have an excellent president, Brian Orm, who provides great vision and new ideas, and our vice president, Gary Baker, has a CS undergraduate degree and an MBA, and he basically leads all of our technical development. So hiring people smarter than you, you shouldn't ever feel threatened in doing so, because eventually you become obsolete and can leave, okay? <laughs> Hold on, sorry. So, <clears throat> some of the keys to success are to, at least our key, key to success, for those of you who have built regression models, you know, that, you know that there are many ways to misspecify a model. At Sawtooth, we have analyzed thousands of data sets 
and compared predicted with actual outcomes to solve business problems. Although you may not understand all the math in our published formulas, they are intuitive and understandable. Word of mouth is how people find out about our company, which means we don't need a sales force out there selling the product. We regularly, regularly survey our customers to make sure they feel we are their partners in marketing research. All of our algorithms are published. Some of them we, we created ourselves and others were shared with us by professors and other professionals. This is our main R&D arm. Sawtooth software conferences are held every nine months, alternating in Europe and the US, and have become a forum for exchanging ideas for the industry. We even invite our competitors to present papers to our customers. Now, some of the challenges that we face are if you, main, if you retain all your employees, again, only three left in like 15 years, where's the corporate ladder that you can climb? There is no corporate ladder. <laughs> What we also learned is that programmers do not always make good managers. So kind of that uh, Peter principle where sometimes people get advanced or move up in the organization to the point where they become ineffective and incompetent. The idea of keeping programmers as programmers, and <laughs> I can remember talking to a programmer once that we had hired, and I asked him about his future, and he looked at me with this puzzled look in his eye, and he said, Future, I'm, I'm, I'm programming, I'm doing what I want to do. Well, don't you ever want to you know, become a man? No, I just want to be a programmer. It was kind of a, a mind shift for me that uh, that's what they wanted to do and they were doing it. So one of the other challenges you have if you don't have new employees coming in all the time or employees moving out and come, you have limited ideas coming in from the outside. So there's a need for continual research and development. The other challenge that we face is that there, are, there is competition from larger players in the market. Okay. okay, here we go. So this is the first machine we used at, when we began developing our software at John Morton Company, the famous Apple IIe with a five and a quarter inch floppy diskette and 48K of memory. So we, just, we have moved on, whoops, sorry, let me go back. From the Apple IIe, we went to the IBM PC. From the IBM PC, we went to the IBM PC Junior. That was a fail. None of you will ever remember that product. We went from DOS operating system to Windows, Windows to web, and now we are doing software as a service. So sales and everything software as a service. We've had to make those technologi technological leaps along the way to stay in business. We couldn't be content. Okay. In 1994, the company moved from Sun Valley, Idaho, where we had our roots, to Squim, Washington. The company then relocated to Orem, Utah in 2011. This was about the time that I started to take less and less of a role in the company. I did not move to Orem. I stayed in Squim, Washington. At that time, we had about 12 full-time employees. Most recently, <clears throat> we've relocated from Orem to Provo. We bought a building that should house us for about 15 years. We have 32 full-time employees and six part-time employees. That's a group of our Motley crew there. Okay. So who are our customers? Marketing research and consulting firms. That's our forte is marketing research. Or large companies with market research departments. Universities, government. We sell about 60% domestic, 40% international. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a short video. Hold it. That introduces you to our products, and then we'll follow up with a study that we recently did for the Polynesian Cultural Center. Okay. 
Get my technical expert here to help me. You plan to bring a new product to market and you have a lot of choices to make, but you don't want to waste time, money, or maybe risk your company's reputation by making the wrong decision. What if before you went to market, you knew exactly which combination of product benefits would help you capture the greatest share? With SAW2 Software's Choice Simulator, you'll take the guesswork out of your development and strategy. Using your conjoint survey results, the Choice Simulator simultaneously analyzes thousands of possible product combinations, helping you understand the value consumers place on each feature of your product and potential market reactions to feature trade-offs. What if your product is first to market? The simulator can tell you which combination of features and benefits will attract the most consumers. Or what if you're entering a competitive market? The simulator can help you determine how your product will stack up against your competitors. The best part of the simulator? It's simple. In fact, it's so simple and effective that many successful companies and organizations across the globe are using it now. Are you ready to launch a product or service that's fully optimized to meet consumer demands? Try a free demo of the Choice Simulator today. To find out more, contact your research provider or visit us at saw2software.com. So this just kind of gives you an idea of what we do with our software. We help companies bring products to market. Now, it, you can be a manufacturer. Maybe you're a service provider. Maybe you're doctors trying to explore uh, new um, medicines that uh, you might be prescribing to your patients. Maybe you're a um, financial institution. You want to bring a new checking account to the market. You want to see and test these ideas prior to actually coming to market. Those are the types of products, those are the types of tools we provide industry to help make those decisions. Okay. Okay. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a study that we recently did using the software. In the fall of 2017, Professor Huff's class conducted a focus group to suggest improvements to the Hukilao marketplace. So we conducted what we call a max diff study where we show guests four things at a time and ask them to pick the best and the worst option. We collected data from about 154 respondents, and that's the makeup, many of them residents, some of them non-residents. Okay. So what we found, this is the max diff results. I know it's a little tiny, really hard to see up there. But the top choices for improvements at the Hukilao marketplace were one, a farmer's market, a concert music series, and 3D art in the marketplace. Okay choices were a malasada truck, a Thai truck, but bottom choices were a noodle sushi truck and lawn games in the uh, grassy areas. Now, for various reasons, Hukilao Marketplace was unable to implement the top choices, so they moved on down the list. Okay? This is the kind of information so that we actually tested it with locals and with guests to find out what things would enhance the Hukilao marketplace before actually having to try them. You can save a lot of money in, and eliminate a lot of guesswork in terms of planning. Okay? So those are the kinds of things we have done at SAW2 Software. I've done it my career. But let me just give you a few takeaways from this presentation. Number one, marry well. Absolutely critical and important, especially for me. I need someone to control me. So my wife and I actually make a great team. So begin today to decide and set your career goals. Decide what your family, life, and work balance will be. Decide what is sufficient for you. Because when I stepped down as, uh, I think at the time I was vice chair of the company, and CFO, when I stepped down, I basically sold all my shares back to the employees to keep this model running of if you're an employee, you know your efforts are going, you're going to see the benefit of your efforts. 
Next one, always get agreements in writing. None of these verbal promises. That is so important. I was pretty bummed when I got fired from uh, that company early on in my career. There are many different paths to success. You do not need to follow the Amazon model. There are other models that will make you successful. And <clears throat> profit is more rewarding than growth. That's my key message to you today in terms of understanding. You don't have to be growing, growing quickly. You can be profitable and actually do quite well. Finally, I'd like to encourage you to find a career where you can find happiness every day. Just about everyone at Sawtooth Software, even today, we look forward to coming to work. It's no, not a drudgery or anything like that. We love coming together. We're friends. We're still small enough that uh, we feel like family. And sometimes there's a lot of advantages to having that family feel, as opposed to that first company I joined where we grew to 450 in one year. Okay. So I'd like to thank you for your time today. That's basically my presentation, but I have to do some advertising here. We are looking to hire another student in our strategic development and research office here at the PCC. We'd encourage you to apply. In the past three years, Sawtu Software has hired three BYUH graduates. Some of them you may know. Christina Hubner, who worked in our office at the PCC. Grant Lingard, a computer science student. And Brandon Peck, a business accounting and biology student. And if you're interested in jobs, that's the URL for Sawtu Software. Okay. Anyway, I want to thank you for your time, and I hope what I've said might be of interest to you. We have, I guess, a few minutes for Q&A? Okay. Back here, yes. State your name and where you're from. So we have many positions within our company that, uh, can you hear me if I'm standing away from the mic? Yeah, so, so you're asking uh, what, what about this position? We actually have several positions. We don't hire a lot of people, but we do, well, the people we do have to have a very close fit. We feel like a family, and we're still small enough we can do that. We're still small enough that we can, in essence, have fun outside of work as well as inside of work, okay? So I would encourage you to go up. You can see what jobs we have posted. We don't always have jobs posted up there, but it's a marvelous opportunity to have this kind of family feel, and we're really interested in fit as well as balance in people's lives. Now, I have to admit, we do have a couple of people in the company that, okay, I have an undergraduate in computer science, okay? So we have a few other computer nerds in our company. And sometimes they're not the most social, but they're perfectly happy, and we have a great relationship with them, and we utilize their skills. And so we have, have, a, have a good company. We all enjoy coming to work. We all enjoy being with each other. Okay? Other questions? That, that's a great question. Um, so when I was living in Boston and joined Graphic Communications, that was probably the biggest mistake. I poured my heart and soul into this business startup. I did not have anything in writing. And even though this was a good member of the church, a friend, in the long run, I was fired from the company because it was being acquired. So that was probably my biggest mistake. My other mistake might be that when I was working for John Morton Company, I was putting in a lot of hours. I was able to remedy that situation by moving to Sawtu Software because it's important for you that you have balance in your life. If you pour your heart and soul into your career, if you're a computer nerd, which is my background, if you 
if you are a computer nerd and you're spending, you know, uh, 23 hours a day programming, you're going to get burned out. You're not going to be social. You won't have a life. So I think it's very important to have that work-life balance and look for jobs which will support that work-life balance. So important. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time today. I'll turn it back to you.